Hollywood. Theater brings you Betty Davis and Paul Henry in Mr. Skeffington. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Some years ago, I went to a graduation play at a dramatic school in New York City. The leading lady was a small but able miss named Betty Davis. A few days later, when we were casting for a new play, I suggested that Miss Davis be given what proved to be her first professional reading. The rest is history, for little Betty has since become the first lady of the film. Warner Brothers' moving and distinguished drama, Mr. Skeffington. And co-starred in the title role tonight is Paul Henry, who has contributed so many star interpretations to the screen. The action of our play occurs between two world wars, a period during which women, like the lovely Mrs. Kevington, discovered new freedom and leisure, largely through the medium of labor-saving methods and conveniences. Now, on to our play, as the curtain rises on Act One of Mr. Kevington, starring Betty Davis as Fanny and Paul Henry as Kevington, with Marjorie Reardon as their daughter, and Joseph Kern as George. I called this afternoon on my cousin, Mrs. Job Skeffington. It was late when I left, almost dark. In the little park across from the house, I saw him. I don't know how I came to recognize Job, and so broken he was and shabby. His hands rested on his cane. He stared through the quiet dust like a man in a dream. Who? Who is it? Joe. Joe, it's I, George Trevis, and his cousin. George. Hey, Joe. When did you get back to New York? I? Yesterday. I skipped, George. At the age of 62, I escaped from a Nazi prison camp. Joe. But we, we didn't know what had happened. So you're going to see Fanny? Come on, I, I just left her. No, I, I had no plan to see her. The house is still there. Oh, just as it's always been, Joe. Nothing's changing. Fanny's well? Oh, yes. Yes, she's well. And my little girl. Little Fanny. She's fine, Joe. Oh, what a pity. She left New York this noon. Gone? On her way to Seattle to be married. Married? A fine boy. Oh, they're very much in love. Married. Joe, Joe, come. We'll see Fanny. Uh, no, later, bad. I don't know. Well, then come home with me. There's so much to talk about. You said you had nothing to change. There's no right. I'd just like to sit here alone. What? Yes, of course, Joe. Please, uh, say nothing to Fanny about me. Not, not yet. If you wish, Joe. Good night. <laughs> I went directly home, and all night long I sat here unable to get the picture of Job Skeffington out of my mind. <laughs> Seems incredible that nearly 25 years have passed since Job first met Fanny. Oh, how well I remember that night. Who is it? Edward? Don't you dare come in my room. Since when am I Edward? Then who is it? George. Which George? How many Georges are there in your life? All three of them. <laughs> Fanny. Oh, what a wonderful surprise. <laughs> well, don't I get a kiss? Oh. Hmm. Let me see. Yes, even after two years, you look rather nice. Rather nice. That's all you ever say. I'm sorry, but I just can't think of you as beautiful, even if you are. Oh, hello, Mamby. Mr. George, how do you do? Uh, tell me, I saw four strange faces downstairs. Who are they, Jupiter? An entirely new bat. She still has every man in New York at her feet, Mr. George. And you're going out with the bat? Out? Oh, no, it's a dinner party, and you may stay. Oh, thank you, cousin. Well, I thought I heard that voice. Crippy! Well, well, welcome back. How have you been? Why, fine, how have you been? Couldn't be better. Don't fall down in the face, Georgie, but my brother has a job. He's working. No, I'm a customer's man. Skeffington and Company. Skeffington and Company? The Jewish firm? Yes. Well, I 
wife working for him? She's all right. Well, he must pay awfully well. Here you are giving dinner parties, and I thought you were practically broke. Well, the fact is, George, I made a little killing. And I thought if I gave a dinner party, it might further arouse this killer's interest. George, you don't have to worry about us anymore. I hope it's all true. I... Why do you say that? Because you still don't look anyone straight in the eye, Trippie. Still picking on me, Georgie. Now, now, Trippie, darling, you run along and finish dressing. You know you're always late. What is it, son? I'm very sorry, Miss. But that's what you see, Mr. Trevor. Or Mr. Stephen. Stephen? We didn't invite him to dinner. I most certainly did not. But tell him I'll see him in the morning. Yes, sir. And Miss, your guest will be in the Thank you, sir. Uh, so, Ask Mr. Skeffington to wait. Yes, Why? Well, I think it'd be a nice gesture if you saw your employer. Uh, you get more work out of him in the long run. He's got no right barging in here. Darling, obviously he didn't come for a free dinner. It must be something important. Well, get rid of him. I won't see him. Well. Huh? What do we tell him about Trippy? Oh, I'll think of some lie or other. Trippy keeps me in practice. Let's get it over with, Georgie. And please, don't miss those words. I'm so sorry about sitting, Mrs. Jefferson. Unfortunately, he's in bed with a severe a cold. Both. <laughs> well, it's quite possible the cold brought on the headache. Uh, yes, he, he'll be at his desk in the morning, Mrs. Jefferson. I hardly think so. Uh, your cousin is no longer in my employ. No longer? But if he's no longer in your employ, why hasn't he told me? Well, a man with a cold is seldom very communicative. Well, if you'll excuse me. Uh, there's uh, nothing you care to discuss with us? Well... Since your cousin avoided me tonight, as undoubtedly he will again in the morning, perhaps I'd better. Uh, it's a rather delicate matter, Miss Teddy. I'm staying right here, Mr. Jeffington. I'm on my way to see the district attorney. I don't think I'm going to be able to take you standing up. Maybe we'd all better sit down. Uh, thank you. Has Trippy done something awful? Uh, your brother has good many qualities, Miss Teddy. Uh, this is going to be worse than I thought. As a bond salesman, he made a brilliant start. His orders piled up until we discover that these people he's been selling stock to don't even exist. You see, he, he's doing enough consolations to make the whole thing seem quite authentic. And then, well, there, there were here and there, there were uh, some legitimate sales. But you had to look for them. It wasn't very clever of him, was it? He has a definite talent for picking odd names and addresses. But it's hardly worth $20,000 we've paid him in commission. He's stolen $20,000? Yes, I'm afraid so. Does Trippy know you know? Yes. You should have gone to the district attorney long ago. Well, I was quite touched to discover he lost most of the money at the race track. That touched you? Yes, sir. Uh, considering they were my horses he bet on, and I'd give him the tip. Oh, Trippy. Trippy, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Freddy. Fortunately, it won't be any hardship for you to return the money. No hardship? Uh, Mr. Skeffington, you may as well know that Miss Sellers and her brother are stone broke. I don't understand. The Trevi's twelve was a leap. Oh, well, now it's a myth. It's been a myth for some time. Mrs. Skeffington, Trippy could get another job and pay you back a little each week. You couldn't write him a reference, could you? Well, I could. But my heart wouldn't be in it. Well, all we can do then is to throw ourselves on your mercy. Uh, Miss Trevi, it's not my money. It's the corporation. But the horses were yours and not the corporation's, weren't they? Yes, that's true. Uh, but I'm not quite sure of the logic. If you could just give us a little time, maybe there's something I could salvage. Well, perhaps I can let it ride for a little while. Oh, Mr. Skeffington, how can I thank you? How can please, I... Please, please. Well, I see my... I'm keeping you from your guest. Oh, won't you stay for dinner? After all, in a way, you're the host. It's your money. I'm dining with the district attorney. Uh, just a social call. Uh, good night, Miss Trelly. Good night, Mr. Skeffington. Mr. Trelly? Good night, sir. I'd like to wring Trippy's neck. There's nothing to worry about, George. No? No. There'll be three dozen roses in the morning. Three dozen roses? From Mr. Stephenson. Oh, good morning, Miss. Good morning, Mandy. Just look, Miss. All these flowers. What a beautiful basket. Oh, Mandy, which ones are for Mr. Stephenson? No flowers came for Mr. Stephenson, Miss. These are Mr. Thatcher's and Mr. Condon's. Were there any calls, Mandy? I mean, other than Mr. Thatcher's and Mr. Condon's? The Reverend Dr. Parker. He wanted to know if he sold the bazaar ticket. No, not a one. You're sure there were no other calls? No, miss. Uh, Mandy, would you mind looking up the address of the uh, No, no, never mind. 
Mandy, I'm going downtown. If my brother or cousin should ask, I'm going shopping. Miss Trellis, I... Well, uh, please come in. I had no idea you'd be calling. I, I knew you were busy, Mr. Stephens. Yeah, I didn't mind waiting, and oh, I do want you to know I'm not here to talk about Christy. Good. It's a painful subject. Cigar? <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. Sorry. It's automatic. All my visitors are men. I see. Mrs. Kessington, I came to ask if you'd buy some tickets for a bazaar. It's for the Children's Hospital or the, the Home for the Aged. I don't quite remember which. Anyway, it's printed on the ticket. They're $25 a piece. Well, I... well, they're both very worthy causes. I'll take a dozen. Oh, no. Two is quite enough. You don't get a thing for your money. Or uh, are you used to that? Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Yes? What is it now? All right. Buy 10000 at 23 in the house. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Skeffington, please forgive me for being so curious, but it sounds very important. 10000 what? 10000 shares of steel. Oh? At $23.50 a share? Why, yes. Well, if you're that casual about money, I'll let you buy the dozen tickets after all. You know, Mr. Skeffington, I've never once seen the stock exchange. I'd be glad to show you around sometime. Well, that's very nice of you, but isn't it a little vague? Can you make it right now? Well, I have a luncheon engagement with Janie Clarkson, but we don't like each other very much, so she probably won't be there either. Well, in that case, will you have lunch with me? Oh, I'd be delighted. Then could I see the stock exchange afterwards? If you'd like. Uh, okay. Shall we go then to the... Have yes. you seen the ticker? No, oh, why? <laughs> Germany just declared war on my... Oh, excuse me, Shirley. Get all our branch offices on the phone. Yes, sir. Keep the wire open to Washington. Hello, Casey. Keep me posted on wheat. Yes, hey, please. Yes, yes, I know. Yes, sir. Keep us up 28th, we buy. No, sell. Sell all the own. Yes, sir. Oh, we've got 12. What, what about you? Chicago? What about Chicago? 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 Shall we call for margin? Yes, yes. There's Casey. Somebody get hold of Casey. Mr. Gaffney, and I've changed my mind. I'm having lunch with Jamie Clarkson after all. Austin wants an immediate answer. Well, they won't get it. It's ready. Ready to go. It's ready. Danny's retreat from Skeffington's office was one of a very rare defeat. And it took the outbreak of the First World War to do it. But two days later, a strange thing happened. Paul Vanney, the famous painter, called. He said he had a commission to paint Danny's portrait if she'd agree. She refused to divulge his patron's name. Danny thought it quite a lot. Weeks later, when the portrait was completed, we went to Vanney's studio to look at it. You know what happened yesterday, Georgie? Jim Connolly offered Mr. Vanyan double his fee for the portrait. That is quite true, Mr. Sellers. Well, why didn't you accept? Because my client is paying four times as much. The extra money keeps me quiet. <laughs> Danny, I simply don't understand. It's not like you to have to spend all these tires and hours sitting for a portrait you won't own for a man you don't even know. I think it's very romantic. Romantic? <laughs> what if we walk into a saloon someday and see you hanging over a bar? Georgie, I doubt very much if I'll ever get that drunk. Anyway... Whoever ordered the portrait is sending $1,000 to my favorite charity. Georgie, would it be charity if we used that money for Christmas? $1,000 won't help, Fanny. So we may as well be honest. Uh, by the way, you heard nothing from Jefferson? Not a word. Hmm. Well, I must say he's been very decent. Sooner or later, though, we'll have to face him. Well, Mr. Vanny, what happens to the portrait now? The transfer men are waiting with the truck. It'll be delivered. Oh, it will. Well, um... Well, I think I'll be running along, Georgie. I have a, a date with Jenny Clark. You do? Didn't I tell you? Thank you very much, Mr. Vanny. You may tell your client I hope he's pleased. On the street, I saw Fanny getting into a taxi cab. A taxi cab parked directly behind a transfer truck. I should have known from the start. She'd find out who commissioned that portrait if it took her the rest of her life. Actually, it took about 30 minutes. The painting was delivered to the home of Job Skeffing. Two days later, Fanny and Job Skeffington went off to New Jersey and were married. Coming back to New York, they took the ferry boat across the North River. Joe? Yes, Fanny? Where were you born? Right there, in New York, Cherry Street. Cherry Street? Where's that? In slums. Skeffington. That's a strange name for the slums. It's not my real name, you know. The immigration official wasn't a good speller. Skeffington was the closest he could get from uh, to Skevin's Kazaya. Joe, do you realize I know next to nothing about you? Are you poor? 
You have no idea how poor. Well, then, how did you become so successful? It's routine. Rags to riches. Of course, I sold newspapers. Of course, I was a messenger on Wall Street and went to school at night. But you can fill in the rest. There's one difference. You didn't marry the boss's daughter. No. But I married the woman everybody else wanted. That makes up for it. Uh -huh. John, what's going on over there? The music and all those people? Hmm? Find out. Attendant. Yes, sir. Uh, what's going on over there? Oh, that's uh, Philippe and Gus. They're playing for those kids. See? Those kids just got married. Sometimes they find somebody that just got married. That's what they look for. Good tip. But how can they tell? Oh, I don't know what they do. They ain't missed up on newlyweds for ten years. Can you beat that? Joe, so, could you tell they were just married? Mm, I think I could. The way that girl's looking at that fellow. You couldn't miss. I feel it you. The way I'm looking at you. No. You look as cordial, but not connubial. I've married you, Fanny. But I haven't won you. Sure. So far, I've merely taken you away from all the others. Do you think that night when I broke into your dinner party was the first time I've seen you? No. I've seen you many times. Dining at Sherry, dancing at the Waldorf. And so many young men. But you were never more beautiful than that night I came to see about Sydney. Never so unattainable. That's why I commissioned Vanny to paint your portrait. At least I'd have that. Well, now you have both, the portrait and me. I own both. It isn't quite the same thing. Joe, look, the musicians are coming this way. Joe, oh, they went right on past you. That's the point I was trying to make before. Fanny, why did you marry me? Because you're good and kind. And your eyes are special in a St. Bernard sort of way. And although I, I've never seen you really smile, I, I always have the feeling you're laughing at me. And I find that very attractive. Besides, you're very rich. Joe, would you like to kiss me? a long time ago, their marriage, 1914. And I wonder when I saw him a few hours ago, alone in the empty park, I wonder if Job, too, was thinking of what I am thinking now, of how, after his marriage to Fanny, he had taken her across that park to her home. She wanted to see Trippy, her brother. Instead, she saw me. Georgie, dear. Congratulations, Fanny and Joe. Well, congratulations. Thank you, George. I, for one, am delighted. Why do you say I, for one? Because all your bows are here. Thatcher, Morrison, Condoley, even that idiot Chester. They're quite crushed. They're in the kitchen eating turkey sandwiches. And Trippy? Oh, Trippy's out. Uh, Fanny, I don't mind feeding your tutors, but you're going to have to console. Well, Joe, should we get it over with? Well, I don't know if I'm quite up to it. They are full of turkey, and I'm not. But come on, I'm game. Well, gentlemen, good evening. I rather expected you'd all be here to welcome me. I don't believe you've ever met Mrs. Stephenson, have you? Joe, Mr. Condoleezza, Mr. Thatcher, Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Hayes. You didn't get married. Oh, Chester, darling, Miss Cranberry on your chin. Could I get you all some dessert? I know I'm afraid the best I can offer is canned peaches. Oh, you can have some dessert. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Stephenson, I'm sure you have enough cake. Oh, thank you. 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 Oh, thank we're on the front page? Not quite. You're listed under business, stand back. Excuse me. If you'd better go upstairs. Shame on you, boys, letting yourselves be out there. That's about oh, enough for me. Fanny, would you mind going inside? Oh, so I'm going to be challenged. He's going to heave his checkbook tonight. Trippy, you don't know what you're saying. You're drunk. I'm the one who swindles you, Steffington. Why did you have to put her in jail? Why, you <laughs> little swine, get out of here. Yes, I'll get out. You make me sick to my stomach. Oh, would you? Would you? Would you? How could you? I didn't even know you were seeing him. But you're so wrong. Joe has character and he's very nice. Oh, don't try to tell me you're in love with him. I'm not drunk enough to bear that. I'll tell you this much. 
You're safe now. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. That's why you married him. Because I owed him $20,000. Trippy, I'm very fond of Joe. But I love you. Now, Trippy, darling, go downstairs and apologize. Apologize? I'll sit in his eye. Trippy, when you get to know Joe... I'm taking very good care that I don't get to know him better. I'm going to Europe. Europe? There's no war on That's just why I'm going. I don't know who's going to get me. The French, the British. I'll talk to Cole. Oh, Trippy, you're out of your mind. Yes, and he's humiliated and sick. I hate him. I hate myself. Sissy, if you love me at all, you won't leave me. I love you very much. But I despise Mrs. Yes. Goodbye. Sissy. Sissy. That was the last we saw of Trippy. I was with Job and Fanny on their first wedding anniversary. Before dinner, Job and I were alone in the study. Are we free for dinner, Joe? Uh, no, uh, at Morrison, probably. Morris? He's in. He's upstairs with her now. Well, doesn't he know it's your anniversary? He said he chose this night especially to ask her for my wife's hand in marriage. Uh, your marrying Fanny hasn't discouraged any of them, has it? On the contrary. They seem to feel they have to rescue her. The trouble with Fanny is he's too kind to them. So gentle and considerate. How has she been with you, Joe? Kind gentle, and considerate. I'm a very patient man. Too. All right, Fanny. I'll leave. But remember, I haven't given up yet. Well, well apparently Morrison is not staying. He'll be back again in about two weeks. Hello, George. Oh, hello, Fanny. Good evening, Joe, dear. George, your flowers are beautiful. <laughs> Do you like my gown, Joe? You look beautiful, Fanny. Beautiful. Fanny, I, I thought you might like this. It's uh, well, uh, here. Uh, you open it. A diamond bracelet. George gets in there. Oh, it's lovely. You know, George, I keep forgetting that Joe can afford to give me things like this. <laughs> How very sweet of you, Joe. You know, I'm simply famished. Is dinner ready? All ready. Uh, one thing about these proposals from Fanny's suitors, George. Yes? Yeah? They certainly give her a whale of an appetite. went to the theater after dinner. Fanny was her usual sparkling self until we returned. And then suddenly she was ill. Before we knew it, she'd fallen to the floor. Uh, don't worry, Mrs. Skeffington. She's perfectly all right. Then why did you faint, Doctor? I usually make a ceremony out of these things, but, well, you're going to be a father. Why? Why, thank you. That's perfectly all right. <laughs> May I, uh... May I go in and see her? I've given her a sedative, but uh, you'll have about five minutes of the usual nonsense. Good night. Good night, Doctor. Uh, is there anything I can do? No. Would you like to be alone? No. I'm very happy about it, Sam. At the moment, I'm more surprised than happy. Don't you like children? They always seem to be so wise. Well, I, I think any child of ours has a far chance of being stupid. You're laughing at me again, Joe. Oh, I suppose I'm just as fond of children as anybody else. Well, it's just that the babies grow up and everybody expects you to grow up with them. You are not afraid of growing old, are you, Fanny? Yes, I am. Do I look puffy yet? Oh. No, you look beautiful. I don't know why. My face is all twisting. I wanted to keep on crying, but I didn't have the strength. Soon I'll be all puffy and ugly. I don't want anybody to see me like that. I couldn't bear it. Thanks. So, George is going to California soon. I want to go with him and have my baby there. But I thought you loved this house. Oh, of course I do, but it's, it's too close to all my friends. I won't have him see me ugly. You'll never be ugly, then. A woman is beautiful when she's loved. And only then. Nonsense. A woman is beautiful if she has eight hours sleep and goes to the beauty parlor every day. And bone structure has a lot to do with it, too. Fanny, aren't you really happy about having a baby? Joe, so, I just can't seem to keep my eyes open anymore. 
I'll go now. Annie's baby was born in California. A month later, she was back in New York, a devoted gentleman flocking about her as fervently as ever. But Job was too enchanted with his little daughter to bother about them. Weeks before the child's second birthday, word came that Trippy had been killed in action. Fanny went completely to pieces in a frightening burst of hysteria. Justify because Trippy was dead. Very little changed over the years, least of all Fanny's youth and radiance. She simply refused to grow any older. During the speakeasy era, she became fashionably involved with a rum runner. And Job, quite openly, started to be seen with girls from his office. But what was in his mind, I'll never know. Only one thing is certain. If he was trying to give Fanny grounds for divorce, he was highly successful. Oh, hello, George. Are you all by yourself? Uh-huh. Job's in the garden. With Fanny? Yes. How was it in court? Charlotte, Miss Walter. Fanny, tell me. Does she know about the divorce, young Fanny? It's quite impossible to keep anything from her. Yes, she's 11 years old now. You don't have to remind me. Oh, Fanny. Can't you find it possible to forgive Job? Five secretaries in a row. I'm not that forgiving. Well, the second secretary must have forgiven him for the first, all the way down the line. Can't you be as forgiving as the secretary? Well, as a matter of fact, Georgie, I'm very grateful to Joe. I must admit I was quite angry at first. Then suddenly I realized the five secretary for five gates of freedom. Now you can live with your conscience. Yes. I hope the two of you are very happy. George, is custody of the child always given to the mother? Why, don't you want her? Oh, of course, of course, it's just that, well, poor little thing. I can't help but feel she's so much farther than the Joe. Oh, well, hello, Fanny. Well, how did it go? Very tiresome, Joe. By nap now and then, so does the judge. Georgie, why don't you run out in the garden and amuse Fanny? Of course. I'm in a highly amusing mood. Well, Joe, are you comfortable with the club? I have a choice view of 47th Street. Oh, I do want to thank you for your very generous presence. Well, 12 years with the wrong husband should be rewarded. Well, of course, it was ridiculous of you to settle a fortune on me, but then it would have been ridiculous for me to refuse. I'm glad you're going to be so reasonable about it. Still laughing at me, without moving or nothing. No laughing at me. Oh, I can't bear to look at you, Job. Your eyes are such a hurt. And I repudiate my eyes. I have no right to do that. I'm sorry, Job. I'm really sorry. I can't love you. You can't really love anyone. Well... That's not meant as a result. It's just one of the facts of your life. You know, Joe, I'm very fond of you, and I might never have taken this step at all if I hadn't discovered. Well, after all, Joe, five of them. Oh, you must think so harshly of my You were very nice and understanding when I came home to the when I came to the office after a hard day at home. Joe, Fanny, I Joe, don't. please don't say. Thank you, Fanny. I never begged you in my life. Oh, I have a dreadful headache. This isn't what I wanted to discuss with you at all. I'm sorry, but I have a headache, too. And I think mine precedes yours by quite a few years. I find it all very distasteful. Oh, all right. What is it you want to discuss? Our daughter. 
He's not going to be very happy staying with me. He loves you so much more. I'm no hypocrite. I'm glad he does. Yes, but you see, the court says a child should stay with its mother. As I mind what the court says. What do you say? Well, I, I think that a child's too, but it's just... Are you I... sure that she won't be uh, a hindrance to you? After all, you're young and beautiful. Don't be insulting. It isn't fair, Joe. You know perfectly well that if Fanny is miserable, I should be miserable, too. Well, what do you want me to do? Just if you could could talk to her, Joe, and, and see how she feels. All right. I'll be glad to. Oh, thank you, Joe. That's very sweet of you. May I take her out to dinner? That would be lovely. Maybe she could wear her blue organ. It reminds me of you. Darling, you haven't eaten hardly anything. I'm not very hungry. You haven't eaten anything, Daddy. Oh, I had a big lunch. It's a very nice orchestra, isn't it? Very nice. Yes, darling. It is. Daddy, aren't you coming home to live anymore? I'm afraid not, Daddy. Besides, I'm, I'm going to Europe in a few weeks, sir. I'll be gone a long time. Oh, Daddy. Now, the wait is coming back. Oh, I'm sorry, Daddy. Everything all right, sir? Yes, thank you. But, well, we are not hungry. Oh, would the young lady have some dessert? No, thank you. Oh, we have some very delicious cream glacis. That means ice cream, Daddy. Mm -hmm. Vanilla, peppermint, strawberry? No, thank you. Uh, you can bring the young lady a tall glass of milk. Yes, sir. Granny, dear. You see. You'll be very happy with your mother. Your mother loves you. But, but you love me too, don't you? Yes. Why wouldn't I be happy with you too? Well, I don't know if I can explain this to you, Fanny. You see, your mother and I are of different faiths. You believe in God, don't you? Certainly I do. Well, so does Mommy. She told me so. Well, Fanny, it's, uh... You see, I'm Jewish. Your mother is. Now... If you stay with her, you will never know what it is to be a... Well, I, I, I mean, if you come to Europe with me, it's different there, and people may look upon you as... Uh, uh, very difficult to explain to a child. If you don't want me, Daddy, I suppose I can always live by myself. Back. Oh, Daddy, Daddy, please take me with you, even to Europe. I won't be any trouble, I promise. You do? Well, let me see. You know, darling, there are wonderful schools in Switzerland. And you speak to Mother? Oh, maybe she'll say that. Oh, she will, darling. She will. Oh, Daddy. Now, I, here comes your milk. Uh, I think I'll have some ice cream after all. Yes, and, uh, waiter, you can bring me a plate, too. to Europe, to Germany, and his daughter went with him. And there, Job stayed. But as little Fanny grew up, she'd come to New York every summer. <laughs> it was too bad she picked that time of year. Her mother never seemed to be in town. My darling daughter, where does time go? I thought surely I could see you this summer. I planned to be in New York in August. But that dreadful yacht at the Bondi broke down off the bank. Dearest Fanny, you think so many years have passed and we still haven't seen each other, but Mother misses you very, very much. I am glad you liked your birthday gift. I don't remember when you... And so it went for ten years. But this year, young Fanny failed to arrive in the summer. She came instead on an embarrassing October afternoon. Her mother was home having a cocktail with a young man. The older Fanny grew, the younger it seemed were her admirers. Fanny, remember that day at the country club when I introduced myself? Yes, Johnny. Well, I'm finally going to say what I wanted to say to you, then. I'm in love with you, Fanny. You're really very sweet, Johnny. Oh, that's all of his home. Johnny, if we're going sailing, we'd better get started. Do we have to go sailing? Oh, but I love sailing. What is it, please? Excuse me, madam. A young lady to see you. A young lady? Hello, Mother. Good heavens. Fanny. 
Uh, Fanny Suffolk. My darling, this is such a surprise. Yes, sir. I suppose it is, Mother. You know, you're the uh, beloved person I expected to see. Is um, your father with you? Oh, no, he, he's still in Berlin. He says the Nazis don't frighten him, but he thought I'd better come back here to you. And here you are. Here I am. Uh, oh, Tony. Oh, forgive me, Fanny. This is Johnny Mitchell. Fanny and I, uh, Fanny and I haven't seen each other for years, have we, darling? You know, you're very uh, tall for your age. Really? Oh, but mother, I'm nearly... Oh, you're going to be a stunning woman, don't you think, darling? Oh, yes. Yes, he's going to be. Darling, Johnny and I are going to go sailing. When I get back, we can talk for days and days. Fanny, do you think we are? Do it get pretty chilly? Chilly? You talk as if you were 40, 50 years old or something. Certainly we're going sailing. Well, I'll, I'll see you later then. Oh, yeah. Hey, wait. I, I can't call you both, Fanny. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call you young Fanny and you... Well, uh, I'll think of something. <laughs> Hello? Danny? Yes? This is Johnny Mitchell. Yes? Look, I, I don't want to alarm you, but... Well, your mother... We were coming in when she... Well, she, she just collapsed. She got pretty wet sailing. She, she must have gotten a chill or something. Where is she now? I'm bringing her right home. You, you'd better call a doctor. Is your mother's maid around? Mandy, yes. Well, Mandy will know who to call. I'll, I'll have her home in half an hour. <laughs> That night, Fanny was in the hospital with a raging fever, hysteria. Doctors warned that she might not live. At her age, they said. At her age. Who'd ever thought of Fanny as old? The beautiful, dazzling Mrs. Kevington. Well, Fanny didn't die. And in ten days after she passed the crisis. Yes, Mrs. Kevington? Yes. Did Dr. Nelson say when I met him? Yes, Thursday morning. But only one of you, please. Ask him to please telephone my home. Under no circumstances do I want anything. No one will see No one. Oh, hello, Cousin George. Hello, dear. Well, did your mother get home? Mm, ten minutes ago. We were just having some tea. I would have to be out of town when all this happened. Well, did you two finally get acquainted? I'm afraid we've hardly had the chance. The doctor wouldn't allow any visitors at the hospital, and when she went to the rest home, she told me not to come. Oh, darling, you don't know your mother very well. She wouldn't want anyone to see her unless she was looking her absolute best. And they tell me this theory is no beauty. You must have company already, Mother. George, you what an unexpected pleasure. How are you, Fanny? Very well, thank you. Even if I... You look so dreadful. You could never look anything but a dog. You're lying, Georgie. I know perfectly well how I look. Have some tea, George. Wasn't it just like me to contract the child? Mm-hmm. But it's the most dreadful nuisance. Handfuls of my hair came out. Only simply saved my life. Who's always? My hairdresser, of course. I don't know what I would have done without him. But here I am, chattering on about myself. Penny, what have you been doing? Oh, nothing very much, Mother. Have you seen Johnny Mitchell? Yes, I've seen him. He's fine. Joe, do you know who I think he is? Uh, who? Joe. Joe? Yes, he just sits around all day staring at me with those soulful eyes of his. Oh, you mean you've been having hallucinations? Is that what it is? One day in the hospital, I shut my eyes and he suddenly appeared. Now I don't even have to shut my eyes. He appears just the same. Fanny, I do wish you'd write to your father and ask him to stop it. Have you heard from him lately? No, not for weeks and weeks, and I'm, I'm terribly worried. Well, he hasn't had time to write. He's been too busy staring at me. I detest women who go to psychoanalysts, Georgie, but what else am I to do? I'm seeing one next week, Dr. Tyler. Wonderful. Well, now I think I'll go to my room and dress. Georgie, would you help a decrepit old lady up the stairs? Oh, Annie, what nonsense. <laughs> She 
keep talking, Mrs. Skeffington. I told you about the hallucinations, Dr. Tyler. What else do you think to talk about? How old are you? Forty-five. Sixty. Well, I didn't sleep very well last night. Sleep is most important to a woman of your age. If you don't want to be an eyesore. Eyesore? Are you suggesting I am an eyesore? No, nor are you a Lillian Rothall. Dr. Tyler. Sit down. My dear lady, your seeing your husband comes out of a subconscious desire to see him. A need for him. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's where your husband comes in when your romantic days are over. My romantic days are over? Oh, my poor woman. Oh, my poor doctor. Listen to me. The only person who will stick to such a woman as you is your husband. Admirers, sweethearts, whatever you choose to call them, never mean what they say. And always end up by turning sour on the summit. Your result. But my advice is sound. If you don't believe me, find out for yourself. See them, these gentlemen of your past. Ask the whole lot of them in for dinner. You can size them up and they can size you up. Shall I let you obey? If I wanted to, not that I do, but if I wanted to, all I would have to do is smile at one of them. All right, why don't you try it? Oh, you want me to prove it to you? No, to yourself. I'm sorry to have to be so blunt, Mrs. Skeffington, but you're one of the vast army of silly women. Capital S, capital W. You're overdressed, overmade up, and you're most certainly overperfumed. You are the rudest man I ever met. Did you come here to consult a gentleman or a doctor? I strongly suspect you are neither, and I'm not at all impressed with your manner. You will be when you get my bill. Go back to your husband. And you know where you can go. Fanny must have known what the party would be like. But along with her false hair, she wore a false gaiety just as difficult to detect. They trooped in the stout-hearted gentlemen of her past, who now were merely stout. They brought their wives along, and it was all very dismal and somewhat heartbreaking. Fortunately, they left early. All but Edward Morris. He took Fanny out on the terrace. Fanny. Oh, my darling. You say, Edward, romantic as ever. And just look at her. You're bald, and I'm dilapidated. Well, that's ridiculous. We're both in the prime of life. I still want to marry you, Fanny. Edward, you can't be serious. Fanny, I love you. I love you, Fanny. Good please. Oh, Fanny, we'll have a glorious life together. We'll... Yes, Edward. I... I'm afraid I've disturbed your hair, dear. These, uh... These curls. What the mystery? They're always falling off. Yes. They're, uh... Very pretty. May I pin them on for you? No, Edward. Thank you. I think I'd... Just to do it myself. They're very sensitive. Oh. <laughs> well, thank heaven you don't have to worry about things like that. Oh, huh? but I do. Only to be practically They're broke? Well, practically. You, uh, you can't mean that, Fanny. If only I'd had a man who would me, he could have returned a few years early. Yes. Yes, I, I should have. It's getting late. Yes, uh, uh, don't bother seeing me to the door, Fanny. I'll think over your proposal. Oh, 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 well, don't be too hasty. Marriage is, is a very serious step, hmm? Yes, it is. I'm so glad to see you. Goodbye, Fanny. Oh, uh, you don't happen to know of anyone interested in buying a coffee plantation, do you? No, but if I hear of anyone, I should be very happy to let you know. Thank you, Fanny. It's no good, but it's all I've got left. Mother. Mother, may I speak to you? Of course, Fanny. Mother, I just left John. John, you miss me? Yes. We're going to be married. But I had no idea, Fanny. You haven't known him for very long. I've known him for several months. As long as I've known you. Don't you think you should have talked it over with your mother? Have I a mother? That's not very kind, Fanny. I've always loved you very much. Sort of a, a long distance, love. I never wanted you to leave me. It was just that you loved your father so much more. Oh, I know you had a difficult choice. To make. You you couldn't be both a beauty and a mother. Oh, Mother, I, I used to worry about my looks, too, when I was 13 and all arms and legs. But Father would always comfort me. A woman is beautiful only when she's loved, he said. Yes. He said that to me once, too. 
Can you suppose it's too late for me to be a mother now? I'd like to try. Oh, it wouldn't work out, Mother. I see. We're leaving for Seattle tonight. Johnny's opening a branch office there. Well, I... I suppose you wish me luck. Of course, Pam. Thank you. Goodbye, Mother. Goodbye, Doc. <laughs> I'll never leave her. Never. Never. I'm alone. I'm all alone. A few moments ago, Mandy telephoned me. She wanted to know if I'd come over and see Fanny tomorrow. She thought I might cheer her up. Just now, the phone rang again. It was Job Skessington. He said he wanted to say goodbye. He was going to leave New York. But I made him promise to see me first in the morning. Georgie, what are you doing here at 10 o'clock in the morning? Oh, I thought I'd just stop by and see how you were. Well, it was uh, nice seeing all your old friends at the party the other night, wasn't it? It was pure vanity, George. Uh, what makes you so nervous? Fanny. Fanny, I'm worried. I- I've just seen Joe. Joe? But you couldn't have Joe with you, Jeff. No, no, he's right here in New York. If he's here, why didn't he let his own daughter know? When you see him, you'll understand. He's been in a concentration camp. You'll hardly recognize him. They took everything he had, Fanny. Joe hasn't got to stand. Joe, poor. What do you think I ought to do? There's a question of what you ought to do. Of course, you have no obligation. I think you should remember that this house, everything in it, every stitch you own is yours because of his generosity. And it's unfair that I'm so well off and he's so poor. Yes, exactly. Very well. I'll send for the lawyers and see what we can do for No, 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 Fanny. No lawyers. You mean I must see Joe myself? Yes. He's downstairs. Downstairs? In this house now? Go down and see him, Fanny. Never. Look at me, Georgie. Just look at what's left of But you me. always seem the same to Joe. He still loves you. No, Georgie. He loves only what I look like. Oh, that isn't true, and you know it. Georgie, do you think I am mentally deficient? I've beaten the others. They all love me, too. At the party the other night, one kept me, and they all recoiled. And I'm not going to add dope to them. Despise me. You didn't know what a really vain creature you've been fond of all these years. You've never loved anyone but yourself, have you, Fanny? Spent your life in front of a mirror, completely unaware of the people around you. Now, look, here's a chance for you to do something for someone else. A lot worse things in this world than losing one's beauty. Oh, go down. Fanny, you won't regret it. Go down and face it. Fanny, well, I'll... I'll go down. Joe. Fanny. You don't know me, do you, Joe? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You're as, as beautiful as ever. Still laughing at me, Joe. Oh, no, Fanny, no. You see, I am. Uh... Joe! Joe! Joe, where? are you hurt? I thought I remembered where. Oh, Joe! My darling, you can't. They didn't see oh, it. Oh, no. my poor darling. My poor dear, too. And all the time I've been thinking only of myself. Joe. Joe, you're safe now. Uh, you're home with me. You're safe now. Uh, Come, Joe. Here. Here's my arm. Here's your pain. Come along. Mandy? Mandy, Mr. Skeffington has come home. Oh, welcome home, Mr. Skeffington. Thank you, Mandy. Joe, here's George. Fanny, I've never seen you look more beautiful. A woman 
is beautiful only when she is loved. Isn't that right, Joe? Mandy, would you call Janie Clarkson? Tell her I can't possibly see her for lunch today. I can assure you it's been a real pleasure to work with two such stars as Betty Davis and Paul Henry. And the result has been a play we'll long remember. It's good to be back with you again, Bill. Again? Have you two worked together before? Oh, yes, Paul. I was dialogue director on the first picture in which Betty changed from innocent ingenue roles to, uh... Go ahead and say it. Well, Betty, you know you have brought more misery to humanity than any other star in Hollywood. <laughs> but only on the screen. Well, as long as we're patting people on the back, Bill, save a pat for Paul. Well, <laughs> I was just coming to that. Good night. Good night. Good night, and come back again soon, both of you. <laughs>